Uh, tonight is a very special episode of Emerald Hill Skies live stream because we want to do EAA. We want to actually demonstrate it as we go. And in order to do that, we're just going to dive right in. Uh, we hope that you'll be a part of this, though. If you are maybe with us tonight in the live stream and you are a practitioner of EAA, would you just maybe share at least, you know, what is your first name and uh, where you're logging on from and how long you've been practicing EAA, how long you've been implementing it, how long you've been observing as an electronically assisted astronomer. And that'll maybe help us, um, um, you know, be able to maybe um, crowdsource this. So Guy, I'm hearing you say you can hear me on the left channel with the music on the right channel. So let me try something different here. I'm going to try it like this and see if that's better. And now, Guy, if you don't mind telling me, what is the the volume of that music like we, we basically don't want the music very loud at all we just want it to be in the background so uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, telling me does the music need to come up or down i would really appreciate that uh, anyway north of montreal guy okay uh in uh canada and also if you could tell us if you are an eaa observer how long you've been active that'll that'll be really helpful um I know that tonight we want to dive right in with observing. Let's get started on the first object. Oh my goodness, Frank. We are so glad you're here, Frank, and hoping you can help us. Can you just sort of, if you don't mind, Frank, would you help moderate the, the comments? That'll help me a lot if I miss out on some of the comments. Frank's been going for about, I think, what, Frank, a year and a half or so, something like that. Uh, Guy, we are so glad you're with us, and I understand that you're looking for information this is the first time that you've ever uh, delved into it. And we're thrilled to have you here. That gives us kind of a reason to be here, you know, so we've got, we've got a purpose now. So Frank, if you can help with uh, moderating and we'll keep asking you questions along the way. So let's get going. The first thing we want to do is here in our um, planetarium software, and this is uh, just uh, in our planetarium software, uh, here in the main part of the screen that you're seeing now, this is just a computer application. So this is not a live view of the sky. What we want to do is use this planetarium software to be able to see where the objects are in the sky and also be able to move our telescope to those objects. So to make that happen, we're going to go up here under View and go to uh, show telescope control and we're going to connect to the telescope and we'll wait and make sure that tells us that everything's connected sometimes it takes it a minute to get that feedback it's kind of fine print for you up there but uh, it is saying now telescope is tracking so we're going to go ahead and close that little applet and what you might see now if you can zero in here with me uh, zoom into the night sky with me up there the scope is pointing at Polaris, and you can see that uh, right here, it tells us that not only is the planetarium software showing us our rectangular field of view, approximately, it's not exact, but a, a rectangular field of view of what our camera is seeing, but we also have assurance that that's where the mount is pointing, because right here is a telltale sign. It's the, um, it's the actual wording of our, of our mount, which is an ioptron. Uh, CEM70G. Uh, so that mount is kind of synchronized with what we're looking at here in the nighttime sky. So the first thing we want to talk about with EAA is we figure you ought to get some kind of planetarium software. Now there are different kinds and I mean I happen to be partial to this uh, uh, this planetarium software that you see here in front of you. It's called Starry Night Pro Plus and uh, you know, I have a whole series on it now. I think we're up to 12 videos on it. Some of the reasons why I like it. But let me just sum it up to say, I think it's beautiful. <laughs> I mean, that's the main thing. I'm really attracted to all the beauty of this nighttime sky. And when the clouds are out and we're not able to look at the real thing, I can get a lot of kicks out of just looking at the beauty of this night sky. Now, there are a lot of beautiful planetarium software uh, that you can choose from. Uh, we did a video recently on a, another one called the Sky X. Uh, I happened to try that out. And to be honest, I'll just shoot straight with you. I thought that 
Starry Night Pro is more beautiful than the Sky X. Now, I know there are probably people that like the practicality of the Sky X, but it is kind of expensive. It's like $300 and something. Uh, Starry Night Pro is much less than that. Uh, another uh, planetarium software that you often hear people talk about is a is an open source uh, planetarium software called Stellarium. And it's run by a very active bunch of guys and gals, I'm sure, that are very active coders. Uh, so they, they keep us busy, you know, with Stellarium, all the updates. And, and I'm sure that that's a great program. I tried Stellarium, and for me, in my context, I just liked the looks and the feel and the power of Starry Night Pro more. Starry Night, uh, Pro more. So that's something you'll have to decide. I think you might try Stellarium first since it's free. And if you like it, then just stay with it. You know, that's one way to start out. Uh, so Frank, I don't know whether you want to talk about what you like. I think you've tried just about everything in your year and a half. But uh, when you get a second, Frank, in one of the comments, if you could tell which planetarium software you like, I think you've used Stellarium as well. Now, the next thing you'll need in um, electronically assisted astronomy is some kind of software to be able to capture the images that you're seeing through the camera. I'm not necessarily going in sequential order here, but what you're seeing here live is now a picture of the night sky um, real time. This is actually taken through our telescope, and maybe over there on the right, you can see uh, our telescope. You can see that it's a... Um, a rasa, and um, let me see. I'm gonna, I'm gonna work with this uh, frame here, kind of make sure you're seeing um, not only the the telescope, but also let me see that you're seeing the the live view of the night sky through our our kind of electronic viewfinder scope too. So I'm gonna bump these up a little bit. So I make sure I get those all arranged. See if that's a little better. Uh, so this main window now is showing you uh, the view window of a software called SharpCap. And it's not very much. If you buy the pro version, which is what you'll want, it's like $15 a year, you know. It is worth the investment. Now, there are several of these kinds of imaging programs you can use. I think one of them is called, uh, is it Jocular? I can't remember the exact name. Um, some people use, again, the Sky X or whatever, I'm sure, to take their pictures. A lot of people are using Nina because it's an astrophotography program. APT, there are several different kinds. But for me, the software that gives us the best um, operating view and operating uh, parameters for EAA is SharpCap. Oh, we should not fail to mention the software suite that ASI puts out with their cameras the ASI Air Suite. And a lot of people just love that. It's uh, it's set up so you can use it on your phone wirelessly with your cameras. So if you're going to buy an ASI kind of camera, definitely look at the ASI uh, Suite. It comes free with the camera and you don't even have to pay $15 a year. And they're working uh, very hard to try to catch up to SharpCap. Uh, again, everybody's got an opinion, right? In my opinion, they're always playing catch up. Um, Robin, the guy who's the lead developer on SharpCap is just amazing, at giving us these capabilities. But um, you might try as ASI Air and ASI Air, it's a whole suite of programs that you'll, you'll see at the uh, ZWO website that'll show you your different cameras. So I'm gonna take a look here at the comments and see how Frank's doing. Looks like Guy has shared uh, what kind of rig he's got. Yeah, Frank's been working for about two years. Uh, Guy's got a, a modest system, an on-step modified Orion Astroview EQ3 mount with Celestron 130AZ reflector. So that would be probably what a, I'm not familiar, maybe a, a four inch reflector. Um, I can't remember what that model is. Um, and then um, what kind of results? Guy's asking, Frank's answering that. Um, and then Frank says he's grown accustomed to Solarium. He prefers it over Starry Night. Can't get over some of the images they've decided to put in their program. So I like this, Frank, that we have a good balance. Uh, I like that. I don't think we should probably ever get to the point that we promote something as the one and only solution, unless it's SharpCap. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. 
but uh, I like it that you're uh, sharing. And Dennis, we're asking you if you've ever done uh, uh, any kind of EAA, electronically assisted astronomy, just to share how long you've been doing it, where you're logging on from, and help us in the comments so we can uh, crowdsource this instead of making it one guy. I see it's a five inch, and d uh, maybe Frank, you might be able to brainstorm with a guy about what you think he might be able to see. I think what we'll do here is we'll go to our first target. And again, I'm going to go to Starry Night Pro, and we're using their uh, uh, session list, uh, observing list feature. I think I'm going to go over here to sessions, and I'm going to make a new session here. We're going to say, um, this is session 50, seemed like this was session 51, but now I'm, I mean 52, but now I'm looking, maybe it's just session 50, 51, yeah. So we're going to say session 51, so we'll go 0051, and then we'll say um, intro to EAA. And here at the end time, I'm just going to run that up some. I'm going to say something like uh, 3 a.m. something, you know, and uh, lots of EAA intro in between objects. I'm going to just put that in my session notes so I can remember what we did on this night. Error saving must be, oh, doesn't like the fact that I went into the next day and then didn't advance the date as well. So now we have session 51 going. I'll close that. And then up here, uh, I think we're all set there. So now I think I'm going to go over here under 111 objects. And that's this list that we're working under. Brent, it's good to have you. Six months doing AA with a 72 millimeter refractor. This is very good. We have a Rasa. It's a Roe Ackerman Schmidt astrograph. Uh, and then we ha also have Frank, your scope is an 8 inch. Um, Oh, rats, I forget the exact name, but it's basically a, uh, it's one of the ones that you can make into a hyperstar or an edge, I think it's called. And uh, Brent's got a refractor. Dennis has a Skywatcher EQ5 with a six inch uh, RC. So this is a great batch of scopes we've got going here. I think this will be very uh, good crowdsourcing. And if you're watching this video after we did this program, Make sure you arrange your screen so you can see the comments because that's going to be a major part of our uh, <clears throat> live stream tonight, being able to read all these comments. So I'm not going to be able to cover all of them, I bet, uh, but I'll try to cover a lot of them with the verbal. But you would do yourself well if you can make it so you can see the comments as well. What I did is open up this, um, this list, 111 objects, and we'll talk about this more in a second, and then I just sorted it by altitude. But I want to go to one before we lose it, just because I don't want it to get too low. And that is Andromeda. It's at 12 degrees. Rats! We should have gone to it first before I even talk. Let's uh, just center on Andromeda and see where we are at 12 degrees. I fear that we might already be in the trees. You know, it's down there in the Louisville Light Dome. It's possible that we might still be just barely above the trees. So. You see here in Starry Night Pro, we've got it set up so we can uh, basically see a rough guide. And I bet you can see that our trees are down there and Andromeda is slipping down below the trees. So right now you can see that our scope is making its way over to Andromeda Galaxy. And in the planetarium software, you can see the crosshairs of the scope that actually are going there. And then also, if you look over to the right, you can see the telescope itself slewing there. And then on the lower right, you can see a camera that we have riding on top of the scope that's showing you kind of like an electronic viewfinder. Maybe it's bigger than that, 150 degrees wide to sort of help us keep connected to the night sky. Okay, so now let's go over to SharpCap and uh, it looks like we do have stars here. So that's really good. We're gonna first of all connect to our mount in SharpCap and do a quick, um, um, what we call a plate solve. And uh, in EAA, we have this ability to be able to match the exact pointing of the scope with what it's seeing through the camera. And this is one benefit you get with uh, EAA that you can't get by looking through an eyepiece. Um, what this does is it solves 
the the night sky in its uh, vision, and then it it synchronizes the pointing of the telescope with the actual arrangement of the stars in the sky based on its uh, photo database. And we were off 3.56 degrees because this is our first target of the night. And we don't use some kind of hand paddle and try to do three-star alignment or whatever you've used in the past if you're a, a hand paddle observer. Instead, we're just using plate solving. At this point, now that we plate solved, you can already see Andromeda Galaxy's hub, bright hub there in the middle. Now that we plate solved, we know that that's in the middle. What we can do now is use uh, our um, sharp caps sequencing uh, programming to actually start imaging. And I'm going to put the name of this up here first, M31. And I'm going to start imaging. What this will do in EAA, we can actually um, use sharp caps sequencing programming to do several things at once for us. It kind of saves time. What it did there in that little sequence of programming steps, it changed our uh, exposure time to 20 seconds. It changed our gain to the base level gain for this camera, the Z ZWO ASI 2600MC Pro. And then what it did is it started something called uh, live stacking. And what live stacking does is it tries its best to stack images one on top of the other. And those images are all kind of, you know, mediocre images. But by stacking them one on top of the other, uh, you're able to basically average out the darkness and average out the light. And what this does is it allows you to be able to um, uh, reduce the amount of noise in the sky and increase the amount of signal from the object you're wanting to see. That sounds pretty complicated, but that's exactly what's happening. Uh, it averages out what it looks like you're trying to observe by looking at light sources that stay the same. The interesting thing about the, the noise in the picture, all of the fuzzy light pollution noise and any camera noise that might be introduced, uh, any kind of uh, amp glow noise, all those kinds of noises, those are not patterns that are uh, consistent from one frame to the next. Those patterns change because they're kind of like the the static on an FM radio station when you're between stations. And because that static is constantly changing, the programming in SharpCap is smart enough to say that's not what he's trying to observe. But there are some objects that stay the same. And those light points, SharpCap says, ah, he wanted that. And it averages down the effect of the light pollution and the noise and it averages up the effect of the objects in the sky. So uh, what we do over here now, if you can see, are you able to see? Yeah, you should be able to see this. Down here at the bottom, we color balance the best we can based on the best of the night sky. Now, it happens that this part of the night sky for me is really um, light polluted. And I hope you can see right now in this image, um, you can see the full image of the night sky using our um, kind of our our all sky camera. This is a, a, a ZWO ASI 178 monochrome camera and it's adjusted so the sensitivity is way high. But look at that light dome that you're looking at along that woods. See the the tops of those trees? Uh, that Those are the lights of Louisville. We're, we're here in Bortle 6 sky so we had a lot of light pollution and Andromeda is down in that light pollution tonight. And then over to the right, you see that bright beacon? Well, that's the moon and it's at 97% illumination tonight. So that's another problem that we're wrestling with tonight. But the good news is we are using EAA, so at least we can get a little bit of this, ta this target, can't we? Uh, we're going to use this black level to try to make the sky somewhat black. And then we're going to cheat with the mids and bring those up and start trying to see some of the rest of Andromeda. And I can see that we're we're right now just in the tops of the trees. If uh, if you look here along this edge of the picture, this edge of the picture is the treetops, and right there is Andromeda. But in spite of all this light pollution, and in spite of um, 
you know, the treetops, you can already start to see a black dust lane here that's a part of Andromeda. And as we continue to form it up, uh, you'll see more and more of that dust lane. That's where there's some soot. And uh, it's basically um, just a bunch of dark matter that's hiding some of the nebulosity and gases. And then it's in between the trailing arms of the galaxy, which is a spiral galaxy kind of like ours. Uh, now, we're, we're also lucky to be able to pick up a couple of other objects here. We can see uh, Messier 32 and Messier 110 here that are elliptical galaxies. They don't have as much structure that we can admire, but this little glob here is Messier 110. This little glob here is Messier 32, and then this is Messier 31, and you're starting to see some of the spiral arms form. Even with a 97% full moon and light pollution and the treetops. So one of the things I hope you can realize is that one of the things we like about EAA is that we can sort of overcome some of the problems. Now, take another look at the sky cam with me and try to pick out and see if you might be able to observe anything that looks at all like it might be Andromeda. And I think at the end of the day, uh, you know, if we were observing with an eyepiece tonight, all you would see, if anything at all, is maybe a hint of a star shape in that bright core. But even through these treetops and through the light pollution, we're able to see this beginning of this dust lane form. And we're also starting to see some of the galaxy's spiral arms as well. And we can bring up these mids and accent some of those spiral arms, but as we do, we're starting to accent the treetops. <laughs> and, uh, and the telescope's doing the best job it can, peering through the tops of those trees and the lights of Louisville. But um, hopefully you can start to imagine a little bit, you can start to see, or at least I can see on this screen, I don't know if you can see it on the YouTube stream yet, a little bit of the uh, dust lanes here and a little bit of the dust lanes here. And now I'm starting to see the entire shape of Andromeda as a big spiral galaxy here. So I'm going to go back over to our um, um, planetarium software, and I'm going to say um, a new observation. I'm going to associate it with the list that we're working on tonight. I'm sorry, with yeah, with the list that we're working on tonight, which is 111 objects for light polluted skies, and then the observing session is already set to intro to EAA. You see Starry Night Pro figured that out for us. And then I'm going to say, um, wow, treetops, uh, light pollution, moonlight, yet we could still make out some dust lanes. Still not our best image of Andromeda. Now let's also point out that Andromeda is only at, what is it, 11 degrees above the horizon right now. And you know a lot of uh, amateurs wouldn't even attempt an object until it gets to be 20 or 30 degrees high. They just say we're, we're peering through too much atmosphere. But as you can see in my photorealistic um, horizon that I prepared in Starry Night Pro, so we have some idea of where the trees are, and it's approximate. You know, you can see that we're looking through the treetops and yet we're still seeing a lot of Andromeda and those dust lanes that we're telling you about. Here was that object we saw, M32. And here's the, oops, I'm sorry, we're back on the sky cam. Here you can start to see those dust lanes. Here's that object we saw, M32. And here's the object that we saw, uh, M110, Messier 110. These are both elliptical galaxies. There's not a lot to see there. But here you can see the core of, um, Andromeda Galaxy M31, and then uh, this wide dust lane. Now let's go back over, and now let's look at it here, and you can kind of see that same look. If you use your imagination through these treetops, there's a 32, and there's 110. All right, let me go back and catch up on comments. Um, Frank reminded me, 8-inch SCT with Hyperstar. And uh, Frank will explain how that works in a minute, I'm sure. I'll let him do that. Uh, he's he's sharing with Guy that his rig should be very uh, EA friendly because it's an F5, a focal ratio, 
uh, of, of F5, that means it's fairly quick at drinking in the, the photons and forming an image from that. With the uh, next image 5 camera, he said that uh, uh, you might be a little bit limited to objects uh, that, are, that are a little bit larger in the night sky. And that has to do also with the focal length of the scope. In other words, how zoomed in it is. Just like in, in uh, 35 millimeter photography, if you have a, a, you know, a focal length of 125 on a, a mild zoom lens of 125 millimeters, you're only able to zoom in a little bit. If you get a 300 millimeter you know, focal length, now you're starting to look out there and see those football players. And imagine if you could use a 1,000 focal length. I mean, that'll be what these guys use in the English Premier League with those big lenses you see over to the side. Uh, Frank's uh, focal length with his uh, Hyperstar off uh, is like 1,200 millimeters, I think, Frank. And that lets him zoom in on those very, very tiny objects. My focal length is something like 640. So uh, I do a better job at the bigger objects, but can zoom in a little bit at least so we can see a representation of the smaller ones as well. So that focal length is important. Uh, Guy says, uh, talking about slewing in the house, I've not brought it outside yet. Uh, Guy's working on a motorized focuser. Nice. Wow, you've gotten into this. How do you pronounce that? I've seen that in the print, but I've never pronounced it. Is it Arduino, Arduino controller? That's like way over the top programming. Frank's saying that's great, being able to control the mount and focus remotely is a huge benefit. That's for sure. Okay, so now you can see the treetops in their full glory. Watch how the mount is starting to slew down into the treetops. And Andromeda Galaxy is now just at 10 degrees. So this confirms that we start to see the trees at 13 or 12, and at 10 we're starting to lose them. So we've already done our our, uh, observation of Andromeda. Now let's go back up to where we were. I'm going to go back over to our planetarium software and do a new altitude sort so it's nice and new. Um, Let's go to the Crab Nebula. It's at 52 degrees. Uh, You know what? I think we'll go back to our our starry night, I mean to our sharp cap and stop live stacking. Uh, That way we'll, um, we'll not be mixing up the live stack and now let's go to the Crab Nebula, which is M1, Messier 1. If you tuned in late, tonight we are focused on uh, introducing EAA. It's kind of a special episode. It's an introduction to electronically assisted astronomy. Instead of using a slide deck and talking about the history and showing lots of, you know, what was it like 100 years ago kinds of things, we're just diving in and trying to make this very practical. We've got the aid of four or five amateurs in our comment stream that are able to answer your questions like moderators here on the, the live stream. And Arduin, Arduino, thanks, Guy. I've never pronounced that word before out loud. I've read it, but I hadn't pronounced it. So now you can see we're in a very star-rich field of the night sky. Look how beautiful this is. I mean, how many stars must that be? that we can see here in our in our planetarium software. As we zoom in, you can see that the Crab Nebula is a very small part of our field of view. And that's what this red rectangle is. It represents an approximate field of view for our uh, ZWO ASI 2600 MC Pro one-shot color AstroCam. Uh, that's a mouthful, isn't it? It represents roughly what that camera can see when it's matched up to this optical tube assembly, the Roe Ackerman Schmidt Astrograph 11, RASA 11. And when those two are paired together, you get this approximate field of view. So you can see uh, M1 is going to be very small there. But let's, now that we've slewed there, and slew is just another word for move. I don't know why we say slew. Let's just say move. (laughs) But that's the word that astronomers use. Now, you can already see something fuzzy there in the middle. At least I can. I'm not sure if it's coming through on a live stream or not. We'll do another plate solve. And why do we do this again? Because if we had used a hand paddle, the first couple of things we could do, we would do is try to slew the telescope to three or four bright stars. And we'd try to get the bright star in the middle using those arrow keys. And it's always kind of awkward with equatorial mount. 
Equatorial Mount is one that's aligned with the celestial pole, the axis of the Earth. Um, and it's always kind of a little bit quirky to use those arrow keys. I just skip the whole thing and we go right into observing. And before we observe these first three or four objects we played solve, this one was only off eight hundredths of a degree. So the first one is usually three degrees off. The second one is eight hundredths of a degree. If we've done a good polar alignment, if we've lined up our mount with the pole of the celestial, you know, like extension of the North Pole, then really all you have to do is plate solve and you can skip the three star alignment with EAA. So it really does work well. Now you can still see that little smudge there that is M1. So now we're ready to use our sequencer to change back to our uh, live stacking process. And again, you recall what this does. It changes the exposure to 20 seconds per frame, starts taking time exposures, 20 seconds each. It changes the gain to 100. It clears out the live stack so it can start from scratch. And then it hands over control to the user. Now these uh, steps in the sequencing program aren't something that's programmed into SharpCap. That's something the user has to do, but they're fairly easy with good help from people like we have here on the live stream. Um, it looks like uh, Frank is doing a great job with help from Brent and others. Um, wow, your focal length is 2032? Every time you tell me that, remind me that, Frank, I'm just marveling at a focal length like that. That's three times my focal length. Uh, all right. Looks like we're caught up there. Thanks and welcome to everybody. Again, if you tuned in late, we're focusing on an introduction to uh, EAA, Electronically Assisted Astronomy tonight, and we're doing it by getting really practical. So let's get this object tuned up and just get going. The first thing we do is we reset the color bars in our uh, white balancing. If you're familiar with the idea of white balancing in photography, we, we do an approximate balance of the night sky using a reset and an auto color balance based on these peaks over here. And look, it lined up these peaks pretty well. Now we're going to bring our black level uh, vertical bar over here and line it up roughly with the crest of those peaks. And then we'll bring our mid-level bar and begin to push it a little bit over here and that helps us start to see a little more of uh, the Crab Nebula M1. Uh, moving these bars around is a kind of a an artsy thing. It's a it's a matter of art rather than you know pure uh, computation or math. If it were computation or math, it would you would do it automatically. And there is an automatic starter here, but of course, as you can see, it doesn't work very well. <laughs> so uh, we're gonna again color balance that. It does work well sometimes. It's just that that. Really, a lot of times it's just taking a wild guess. Now, the black levels will work better. We know from experience by bringing them up here. So just use that auto color balance to get you started, you know. And then, really, the best approach is to use your eyes and to practice. Uh, again, if you use the color balance here, you can kind of get a picture. Look how it's averaged down the blues a little bit, and that happens often with moonlight. Let's take a look where the moon is again it's still bothering us even where we're aimed right now the moon is bothering us um, so that that moonlight does play tricks on our on our um, color balance let's see it looks like our blues need to come down just a shade more and that'll let us bring our blacks over maybe to right there and that'll let us push our mids over to right there now at this point what we're going to do is we're going to use the sharp caps zoom feature and what that does it it zooms in on the field of view of this uh, APS-C framed camera APS-C is a pretty wide format it has a, a a pretty wide pixel um, 6,248 by 4,176 pixels. Pretty wide, you know, camera frame. Whether that would be with a 35 millimeter or what, that's pretty, pretty wide. And so what we're doing is we're zooming in on a piece of the wide field of view of that camera. 
Now we're notice we're zooming in at 100%. So we're not uh, zooming in to what you might call digital zoom. Digital zoom is if we might go to like 200%. And that's pretty, but it, it to me it's looking pixelated here. That's because we're starting to shoot past what the pixels are capable of grabbing. Now when we look right here, we're actually seeing uh, the limit of the sharpness of the pixels, you know, as they really occur in what you might call optical zoom. And I think people are familiar with this now uh, because of using their, uh, their smartphones for zoom photos. Optical zoom takes you to the limit of your lens on your smartphone. Uh, digital zoom takes you past that, but you lose a little bit of, you start seeing some pixelation. So what is M1? Well, it's actually a portrait of a star that's in its last days. What has happened here is you've had a star that is losing a lot of its fuel. And it got to the point that it lost so much of its fuel that the outer portion of the star's uh, furnace, uh, atomic fission furnace, fusion furnace, kind of died out. And when that happened, there was no longer enough gravity to hold that material uh, tightly against the star. It, it, it essentially jettisoned its gases. And because it's jettisoning the outer layers first at a, at a lower speed, you get weird kind of dying um, gaseous nebula. And, and as that nebula wicks out and, and dies out from this object, uh, by the way, we just got photobombed by an airplane, I think, there. As that, uh, uh, those dying gases kind of wick out, you get this beautiful ionization from other stars and from maybe some of the last breath of the fuel that was on the inside of the star, if there's any left there. So what we're seeing in these reds are the hydrogen, and then the greens might be oxygens. Uh, these, uh, these edges of those... Uh, elements start to be lit up and ionized by whatever uh, breath is left there. And, and you get this kind of beautiful object, M1. And this is pretty, even though we've got lots of moonlight tonight. So I'm going to go over here in our planetarium software and open up an observing window. And the interesting thing about the way Starry Night Pro works with our, our suite of software is we can now put our observing right here beside the object and we can look at it while we write our notes. So that's kind of a cool thing. Um, so I'm going to say in spite of the moonlight, we were able to make out clear reds and greens of this dying star. Um, all the filaments are like tendrils reaching out almost like crab legs. <laughs> Thus the name, the Crab Nebula. How about that? So we'll close that observation Wait, before we do that, let's look at some of what they say in Starry Night Pro about this object. And again, with EAA, this is what you're doing. And, and so we're demonstrating this live because this is what we do in EAA. We're, we're appreciating the object for the object's sake and we're learning about it as we go. So our object here, our goal, the purpose that we have in EAA is not to snap the most beautiful picture of the object that we can. If we wanted to do that, we just start our camera and we go off and, and watch the Olympics or something. And about four hours later, we come back and there'd be this amazingly beautiful picture of the Crab Nebula. EAA is more about breathing in the object's beauty while we learn about it for five or seven minutes and then going on to the next object. Now, the amount of time you spend on the object is totally up to you. I think some people are kind of over the top trying to force us to be short and quick. And if you get caught up in learning about an object and it takes you 20 minutes, so be it. We've been imaging for eight minutes on the Crab Nebula. 
If it takes you 20 minutes, nobody cares because it's all up to you. And whether you're just doing it for your own benefit or whether you're live streaming so your grandkids can see it or whether you're doing some kind of outreach so the people in your club can see it, it's still up to you. It's your show. You get to, you get to decide. So we're going to read about Crab Nebula for a second. It's the remnant of a star that exploded as a supernova in AD 1054. The supernova was visible in the daytime for 23 days, shining four times brighter than Venus. It was even visible in the daytime sky. Um, the supernova was visible to the naked eye in the night sky for almost two years before fading out. What we see today is the gaseous material ejected by the exploding star. The material is moving outward from the nebula's center at 1,800 kilometers per second. At the nebula's core, now remember, as we read this description, you're not looking at the planetarium software right now, like somebody's computer program. You're actually looking at the real live um, astronomy. You're looking at a live view up in the sky. Of, of M1. Uh, so anyway, uh, at the nebula core is an extremely dense neutron star, or pulsar, which rotates 30 times per second. Wow, that's cool, isn't it? Uh, astronomer Charles Messier observed the Crabby Nebula in 1758 while searching for Halley's Comet. And by the way, he got so mad that this wasn't the comet that he decided to start a list of objects that were not the comet. And I know you've probably heard this story before, but the Messier catalog, which has become arguably the most well-known and recognizable catalog of deep space objects, deep sky objects, it was actually a list of objects that he was mad at seeing. He didn't want to look at them again, so he made a list of things to avoid, and yet it has become one of the catalogs that many amateurs really truly enjoy because they're some of the brightest and the best. Not all of them, but some of the brightest objects in the nighttime sky. This was the inspiration for Messier to develop a list of all celestial objects that might be mistaken for comets like the in the Messier catalog. The Crab Nebula is the only supernova remnant in the Messier catalog. The Crab Nebula can be a disappointing object for amateur astronomers. Look for a dim, elongated glow in a small telescope or good binoculars. A network of the fine filaments can be glimpsed with a large telescope under dark skies and averted vision. Averted vision is what you have to do when you're using an eyepiece and you look through and you can't see much but a smudge. So you look off to the side because the sides of your eyes are a little bit better at picking up uh, things that you couldn't see. But when you're using EAA, guess what? You don't have to use averted vision. You can look right at the object. <laughs> That's kind of fun. Uh, anyway, discern the classic shape of the nebula's central region. The central star is not visible. Okay, so there you go. We we did our own observation. So this is back in the planetarium software. We looked at the object, and now what we often do is take a snapshot of the zoomed-in image. So I use Control Print Screen, and I use this little uh, this little quick little um, screenshot program. It uh, shoves it into my uh, uh, my photo editing free software, it's called Irfan View, I-R-F-A-N View. It's written by a Bosnian guy. I love this. It's uh, open source and, and really well done. I'm going to save as, and I'm going to put it in um, library, um, let's see, in desktop, sharp cap captures, and I'm going to call it M1 dash, and then put the date, 2022 dash, 02 dash, 18 dash, and then I'm going to tell how many frames it was and how long it was. 12 minutes and 38 frames of 20 seconds each. Um, and then I'm going to put my name. And we're trying to get in the habit of doing this so that when we do the Messi Marathon together in March, We'll have all that information. Again, the object name, the date, year, month, date, the amount of integration time, 12 minutes, the number of frames, 38 frames, and then my name, Doug. So I'm going to save that. Then I'm also going to I'll get that out of the way. Now I'm also going to do a uh, save as using SharpCap's own save exactly a scene utility. 
And if I remember to put the name up there, which I didn't, it um, names it according to that. If I change the name, then it says, you've changed the name. Do you want to change it in the thing you just saved? And I believe it's kind enough to change the name, but just in case, I'll save again, just in case it won't. Now, there for sure, we saved another new name. Okay, we're going to look down in the comments and see where we are. Let's see. Uh, see, Frank and Brent and others have been helping here. Catch back up. Okay, there we go. Um, Frank says, with a 6.3 reducer, it goes down to 1280. With the Hyperstar, it goes to 390. Ah, so you're not getting... You're not... I see. 1280 with the reducer, and that gives you an F6.3, which is really an amazing scope for EAA. It's just amazing. Uh, you want to have that focal ratio pretty fast so you can enjoy the object soon, you see. Jeff Kelly, when you played Solvent SharpCap, do you tell SharpCap the target name or does SharpCap somehow figure out the target name? And I'm sure Frank has already answered that. SharpCap gets the coordinates from the planetarium software uh, or what you've told. If you've used a hand paddle, for instance, it can even get it from the mount. That's the amazing thing about SharpCap. It can get the coordinates directly from the mount if you use the hand paddle. Uh, and then uses those coordinates to determine if the target is in the field of view. It's off by some. It corrects the view. Well said, Frank. Place the target in the center. Mashed Potato Mountain. Welcome. Biggest beginner EAA mistake. Don't ever stretch your display histogram and start the live stacking. Reset the display histogram before live stacking. Always. Okay. Thanks for that input. Um, for me, boy, pardon me, but maybe in my limited experience, like I say, I'm only doing this for 14 months. I can continue to live stack while I'm, I can continue to adjust things while I'm live stacking. And the live stack changes according to what I adjust. So maybe we're using different uh, approaches or something. But for me, uh, Mash Tata Mountain, is it uh, Glenn? I can't remember your name for sure. Um, Jeff, thanks, Frank. Jeff's asking to use darks and flats in EAA. Um, oh, and Brent throws in, Jeff, SharpCap has a new annotate feature. You can use it to identify the objects in the current field of view. Let's use that for a second. It's under um, Tools, um, Deep Sky Image Annotation. You can see right there it did... Um, NGC 1988, way up there, and it found the Crab Nebular M1 here. So it's annotating real time based on what we're seeing in this image, which is amazing if you ask me. So now we're going to go back to the 100% zoom, and we'll get rid of the annotation because it just sort of clogs the way. <clears throat> Good way to point that out, uh, Brent. Dennis, I use darks and flats, but you don't have to. They make it better. That's the best answer ever, uh, Dennis. And we are using darks and flats tonight. You can see it tells you over here, subtract the dark, and we have this dark, and subtract the and and then apply the flat, and we have the flats. Now, this is the topic of another video. Uh, we don't have time to go into all of that about darks and flats. Actually, darks and flats are not an EAA-specific trades, so we, we won't cover them, but if you're interested in how to shoot darks and flats and what they do, the YouTube is full of videos on how to do that, so so that'll help you. But uh, Dennis gave exactly the right answer. Uh, darks and flats do help. As you remember perhaps before, darks get rid of any kind of, a lot of, not all of them, they get rid of a lot of the, the um, maybe problems that are in your frame because of for instance, some of the pixels in your camera have become kind of, let's say, defective. You know, a particular pixel is always lit up at full stream, you know, and it shouldn't be. Uh, when that pixel becomes defective, the dark frame, uh, because of the way you shoot it, it, it learns that that pixel is bad and it drops it out when you're shooting these pictures. And that way, those bad pixels aren't suddenly big blue dots in your scene. So the darks really do help make the picture better. And then what flats do is they get rid of a lot of the 
uh, errors you have because of the unique, uh, maybe for instance, vignetting you have, if you have vignetting, and that's a an artifact of your picture that shows dark corners. And with the uh, flats, it kind of flattens things out. That's the name, flats. It kind of makes the frame a little bit flatter for you. So they do improve. Uh, and I'll tell you what else has really helped me. And that is by upping my reds and my blues in this side panel image control box. I learned this from another EAA um, friend. His name is Jim, Jim Thompson, I think. Jim, thank you again. He urged me to bring my reds and my blues up to 65 each. And part of this is due to the filter I'm using. I'm using a Celestron light pollution filter that's made specifically with the Rasa 11 in mind. It's not only with the Rasa 11 that you might use it, but it is kind of in a way made specifically for the Rasa 11, kind of to mate with it. And when you use that filter, it seems like there are a lot of greens in the picture and the picture is just dominant green. And by bumping up the reds and the blues here in the side panel, you compensate a little bit for that increased green and you get a flatter image here in your um, white uh, balance. So let's take another look at our, our, our balance now. Let's do a reset and then an auto color balance. Look how that cleaned up the crests of our, um, of our auto balance. Now, why, our white balance. Why was it able to do that? Because it had more frames to make more decisions about where those colors should be. So it's typical that in EAA, we might do a, a white balance after just one or two frames to get us started. But now that we've imaged this object for 20 minutes, uh, we're able to do a fairly accurate white balance and it gets us a lot better image. The more you shove your black over to here, the darker the sky will be. You'll lose a little bit of the filaments in the outer portions of the object, but I like the way it increases the contrast of the object against a darker sky. So to be honest, my own personal taste is I like to get rid of some of that night sky you know, glow, and I have a lot of it here in Louisville. And then uh, if we can cheat a little, and I don't think we'll be able to cheat a lot, and bring up the mids just a little more, we'll get the object to be a little bit brighter. But uh, on a moonlit night, 97% moon with the Bortle 6 skies, uh, this is probably the best we're going to get. So again, I'm going to take one more picture of M1 just because we gained a little bit of, of nebulosity there with our added time. And I'm going to just save as. It remembers now uh, the place where I am. And you know, if I put in M1, I can actually grab a little bit more of the, oops, it saved it under that same, it, it overrode it, I think. Um, that's okay, because this is a better image of it anyway. So I'm going to close that. I'll do one more, save exactly a scene because uh, again, this is a better image. And with that, we'll uh, stop our live stack by taking our sequencer and saying uh, next target. We're gonna go back over here to the, to the uh, now 20 minutes is probably longer than what most people do under normal circumstances, but I told you up front in this broadcast that this is a little bit unique. We're not gonna hurry through four minutes per object on all these because sometimes we're gonna talk about the the craft of EAA tonight. We're talking about how to do and what is, and we're introducing EAA. So that's why it's taking us a little longer. So that was the Crab Nebula. Let's do another sort of our altitude, just to update that. And I'm looking down here at some of the things that might be good. Let's go to the Black Eye Galaxy. Uh, so we're gonna slew to that. We've already stopped the live stacking. And then another thing we'll do is we'll center on the Black Eye Galaxy in our Planetarium software. Now in this Planetarium software, you can uh, synchronize those so that the, the planetar Planetarium software always follows the gaze of the telescope. And I like that setting. But I've also come to not like it in certain things because sometimes we'll go look at another object while we're imaging an object. And if we have the the gaze of the 
planetarium software centered on the gaze of the telescope and have those synchronized, we can't go look at anything else while we're while we're live stacking. So it's it just works out better for me now to leave them separate. You can see we're in the constellation of Coma Berenices. We're going to zoom in here and look at M34 for a second just to kind of see what we're looking at and make sure our framing is good. And in EAA, this is a good habit to get into. Is there something that we might want to frame better, you know, that's nearby? And really, you know, we're looking around this frame and there are lots of things we could look at, but this is really not bad framing. There you see in, uh, the, the black eyed, uh, black eyed galaxy M64. And uh, we're seeing it pretty, pretty well centered and we might get a few other galaxies. This will be another chance to look at Sharp Cap's ability to, to um, see other galaxies. I'm going to go ahead and bring up the observing window and move that off the side. And now let's bring up Sharp Cap and we can close this and we're at 100%. So when we back off to auto, now you see the objects right in the middle. There's no sense in, uh, in um, doing another uh, plate solve here, but I'll do it one more time because this will be, I think, our third object and it's our third chance for the mount to synchronize its programming with the night sky. So what have we done? As we're going, we've given the mount three little um, like data improvements on its, um, and it did improve by 0.17 degrees, uh, 17 hundredths it improved. And that helps our pointing to become very accurate uh, as we go through the rest of this session. So now you can see uh, M64 is right in the center of the picture. So I'm gonna go ahead and put M64 here. And then I'm gonna change to um, start imaging. And so you see, I don't mind. Uh, every, everybody that does EAA probably has different tactics or, or whatever. I don't mind live stacking and adjusting the cart as we're in the road. You know, that old idiom in Spanish, uh, adjusting the load on the cart while we're traveling down the road. I don't mind doing that um, because uh, it, it works for me. So we'll let that accumulate a frame or two. And as we do, let's talk about a couple of more general things uh, related to EAA. Let's, let's break down the components. If you're watching this video maybe a week from now or a month from now, and you're wondering, well, what do I need for EAA? Let's break it down. And again, guys on the, on the comment stream, uh, help me you know, crowdsource this because we've got a good selection of scopes. We have the Rasa, we have a Hyperstar, we have a long focal length um, SCT, we have a Richie Christian, we have a Refractor. Uh, it's a good crowdsource group here and thank you guys for helping with us tonight. So, so let's break down our kit. Uh, some people advocate that the first thing we ought to start with in EAA is to look at what mount we can afford. Now that might seem getting, you know, the cart in mind before we get the horse, but it really is the mount that drives the telescope. So in our in our metaphor, we aren't getting the cart before the horse. The, the optical tube assembly, the thing that we normally think of as the telescope, uh, this white optical tube assembly is actually the cart. What drives the cart? It's the mount. And I don't know if I have a good picture of the mount here. Let's see. Hmm. I guess the best picture would be to back off and look at the at the larger live view of our scope cam. And this scope cam is one of those little, I think it's, what is it called? SG, I forget, that you can buy off Amazon. A, kind of a high sensitivity night view. That's why this looks, look at that airplane flying by in the background, by the way. That's why this almost looks like it's maybe in the dawn or the twilight, uh, because this is almost night vision um, camera. 
Um, the tripod that you see is actually called a tripeer in this case because it has a solid core in the middle of it uh, be, be, behind that leg that we're looking through. And then up on top of the tripod is the uh, what we actually call the mount. It's a big chunk of hardware combined with a, a bunch of logic board computers that let the, the hunk of metal point with such amazing accuracy that it can be accurate within, as you've seen here already, a few hundredths of a degree. You know, it's, it's amazing accuracy. I, it's a tribute to engineering that these things actually work. Depending on what mount you can afford, that's going to show you whether or not you can afford a big scope, so to speak. Uh, the, these mounts typically that people use in EAA, they'll be anywhere from $600 to $1,700 and on up to a couple of thousand or $2,500. The mount is in a way one of the most expensive things in EAA, but boy, you guys in the comment stream, tell me whether or not you agree. If you don't have a good mount, then it's really tough to do EAA well. Now it can be done. It could be done, but it's tough, you know? So our encouragement, my encouragement is decide what mount you can afford first. And for a larger optical tube assembly, I'm talking about something like eight inches. You're probably going to be in the range of something like the Skywatcher EQ6R Pro. That's maybe the place to start out your, your, your mount uh, is, and that's going to be a $1,700 mount. I'm so sorry. If you want to get started on a, on a less expensive version, decide that up front, you know, but uh, the EQ6R Pro is kind of the workhorse of the, of the larger scope EAA industry. Um, now you can get by with less if you use a smaller scope. This is an 11 inch scope, but uh, you know, you could get by with maybe a six inch or a five inch scope and see amazing views in those. If you get down to a five inch scope, help me out guys. Uh, are we able to then use one of the Skywatcher? I forget all the model numbers, but there's a Skywatcher mount that's a little bit better tuned for a five inch scope. And, but anyway, what we're trying to say is here, get a good mount that is precision. And then the second thing to decide is probably the scope. Um, how big of a scope can you afford? And what we've learned, and I think I can say we, because the guys here that are helping me answer these questions that are experienced EAA guys, many of them with a lot more experience than I have, I think we've all concluded the bigger the aperture, the better. By aperture, we mean how wide is the the tube of your optical tube assembly. Um, can you get four inches? You know, can you get five inches? Can you get six inches width? Then with a six inch width scope, you're going to be really super happy. Anything four, five, and six, you're going to start seeing some really quality objects in the nighttime sky. If, if you want someday to upgrade up to eight inches, all the better. You'll probably see, I don't know, See, it's not just double. It's like six or eight or 10 times the amount of light that you can gather with an eight inch scope above a four inch. And then if you can get to an 11 inch scope, it's not just double. It's six and 10 times the amount if you can go to 11 inch scope. And if you can go 14, it's even better. You know, uh, I bet you most amateurs probably halt around the 14 inch scope. That's probably the biggest they get for amateurs. Uh, I, there might be exceptions, but 14 inches is probably as big as it gets. And uh, I love 11 inch. It makes it very fast. It's a very wide aperture. And, and the next thing to think about in your optical tube assembly is how fast can you make it? You've already heard from um, Frank here that he can put a Hyperstar uh, fitting on the front of his SCT and it sort of converts it into a very fast scope. I'm going to look down into his notes and be reminded he gets uh, 
f6.3 and he gets a focal length of 1280 uh, the focal length drops to 390 doesn't it Frank when you put on your 6.3 reducer and a reducer is a thing that uh, allows you to be able to drink in the light faster when he puts on his 6.3 reducer f6.3 he can see light a lot faster but it changes his focal length down to 390 uh, and then he's talking about to really do planets justice he uses a two power Barlow and that lets him see planets at over 4,000 millimeters which is incredible and Frank we've got to get you on a live stream again when you've got that rig tuned at 4,000 and then get you to see on a live stream that's going to be beautiful um, let's see catch up on the comments here we already did the darks and flats uh, Ernie's here from Buffalo. Ernie, welcome. Uh, Brent finds Darks and Flats pretty necessary with his uh, Celestron 8 SCT, Smith, uh, Schmidt Cassegrain. Uh, his Schmidt Cassegrain uh, Celestron 8, he finds Darks and Flats necessary for that. Gary is here. Darks and Flats make the image much better, especially when it's stretched heavily. Frank says, yes, darks and flats certainly help produce the best results. Gary, it's good to have you. A lot of us learned when Gary was doing EAA, he still does it sometimes, but he's already switched into photometry, which is a whole different live stream subject. Uh, sharp cap can guide you with getting both pretty straightforward. Right. Again, that's a subject of another video. Dennis, um, talking to Gary there, a bit burnout with astronomy. Gary, we're going to pray for you. Uh, getting back in the saddle. Dennis says, glad he's back. Yup, focusing more on photometry and spectroscopy. Um, got a new, I saw your new video on photometry, uh, Gary. Frank is glad to see and hear from him. Uh, Frank says there's actually a button in the toolbar for annotation now. Gary says, got to run. The little one wants me to read her a story. Have fun. Mash Pity Mountain. Plate solving has saved so many people's backs. Amen. Sure, I saved mine. Good night, Gary. Take care, Gary. Uh, does he have a YouTube channel? He does. You can search Gary Hawkins or San Diego Astronomy to get his uh, videos. So search Gary Hawkins or San Diego Astronomy and then search EAA or Photometry and you'll find his channel. Brent, a month behind on my updates. Ernie says, cool. Uh, different vein. Oh, there you go, the <laughs> San Diego Astronomy Association. Well done, Dennis. Uh, Frank, yeah, Robin Glover's been releasing new versions, Fast and Furious. Ernie says, I love my UQ6R Pro. That is a great map. It is the workhorse of the EAA industry, I'm telling you. Uh, Frank says, with short exposure, you can get away with an alt as mount. So let's talk about that for a second. An alt as, alt as mount, you'll experience a bit of field rotation, but if you limit your integrations to 10 minutes, you'll be fine. Um, so, so let's talk about that for a second. The mount that we're using tonight is a, an equatorial mount. And again, if you look closely, you'll see those weights and those weights counterbalance the, the telescope and they're all balanced around an axis that's pointed toward the celestial pole. If you're in the South and if you're in the Southern hemisphere watching this video tonight, your mount is going to polar align with the Southern pole here in the Northern uh, hemisphere. We're going to, we're going to tune our equatorial mounts. So the axis of the mount is pointing toward the North celestial pole, which is very close to Polaris. And then these, these weights counterbalance the telescope so it can spin around that axis and make tracking them in the night sky a lot easier. Um, and then the alt azimuth mount, Perhaps the best way to think about the alt azimuth mount is that back here in our um, planetarium software, if I can get it back up here again, let's close this for a second. Back here in our planetarium software, if we if we back way off, think about the um, the alt azimuth mount as looking across the horizon to see the azimuth reading 
and then looking at the altitude to see the altitude. So basically, if we say, you know, north or whatever, it's going to point toward the north celestial pole, you know. And right now, this would be the azimuth reading. And then the altitude would be how high up you are on this meridian scale that I keep in my uh, planetarium software, how high up you are on uh, reading this. So the alt azimuth right here would be at like, you know, 28 degrees or something if we're pointed right now to where we are. So back here, I'm going to go back to our um, uh, black eye galaxy and say center on the black eye galaxy again. So that's the alt azimuth view. Um, whoops, did I just not show you that because I was looking at the scope? Rats, sorry. Let me do that one more time real quick. Uh, let's let me do that one more time. So if you point north, you're with an alt azimuth scope. It's basically just moving along the azimuth to a certain um, compass point. And then if you tell it the altitude, it's going up to a certain degrees above the horizon. So this might be 27 degrees uh, altitude and it might be zero degrees azimuth, you see. So that's the way an alt azimuth mount works, and it just looks like a yoke. Um, it looks like a yoke, and the, the telescope is is uh, kind of like swinging around in that alt azimuth direction. Now, uh, an equatorial mount gets aligned with the, with the altitude, or we call it the deck, and then it just follows the sky in its right ascension. Uh, so with an equatorial mount, uh, you have really just one motor stepping through the night sky to keep track. And both of them will work. As Frank's pointing out here, they'll, they'll both work as long as you keep your, your time, your exposure short and your time short. Um, Brent says, small refractors do really well too and are very forgiving when you're starting out. My 2.8 inch shows me more than I could see in a 20 inch without the camera. Wow, that's a great uh, commentary on EAA, isn't it? Um, and also on refractors. Frank says planetary requires very fast video frame acquisition. Uh, the final image needs to be, it's a lot of fun. Planetary, Papatech, good to have you. The subject tonight is an introduction to electronically assisted astronomy or EAA. And what we're doing tonight, Papatech, is we're... Uh, looking at uh, objects while we're talking about EAA. So we're combining the actual doing of EAA with uh, talking about EAA instead of showing you a slide deck and a bunch of slides. So now let's practice it for a second. We're looking here at M64, uh, which is the Black Eye Galaxy. We'll do a, a, um, a white balance first. And notice it did the best it could. Then we'll bring over our mids and bring over our blacks. And with our blacks uh, right around that crest. And then we'll zoom in on this object because it's very small in the middle of this frame. You can see why they call it the black eye galaxy. Because if you use your imagination, somebody just hit this eye with a soccer ball or something. And now it's black here under the eye, much like a a black eye would often be. Um, and our mids can cheat up a little bit more and show us a little more of the nebulosity of this object. Look how we're seeing um, the shape of the spiral galaxy, and we're also seeing material that's been thrown out here from the spiral galaxy. M64 is looking good tonight. So let's go uh, back over here to our planetarium software and queue up our new observation again. And uh, again, we'll, we'll bring up, and we'll put this right by it. Now notice, we're still on our observing list. That's correct. We're still on the right, uh, the correct object. And then here in our notes, we'll say, Wow, this object uh, looked great in spite of 97% moon glow. 
we could easily make out the black eye under the bright core as well as nebulosity thrown out by those spiral arms. It's awesome. Okay, now let's do our screenshot of this object. I like to do this because it gives you a quick way to see the object up close. And we're going to save as M64-2022-0. Dash eighteen, dash seventeen minutes, dash fifty three frames, dash Doug, something like that. Um, helps me remember all the pertinent information about it, and then we'll also save exactly a scene. The trouble with the save exactly a scene frame in Sharp Cap is it saves the entire frame. So this object is going to be very tiny. You'll almost have to crop in order to see it, but nevertheless it saves it at the full camera resolution, uh, 6248 by 4, 4176. And you know, there might be some times that you're looking at the big frame and you'll see something out there. This was some kind of satellite or something. Um, who knows? Notice when we're zoomed in, we can get away with some of the moon glow stuff that's caused by our vignetting in this uh, in this mediocre um, uh, back focus tuning that I have on this Rasa 11. And it is mediocre. I was just eager to get to observing. So this is a mediocre job of tuning the back focus. And once we get to warm weather, I'm sure I'll get at this and tune that better. But on a night that's not moonlit, we are able to get by without seeing that. It's just the moonlight really accent accentuates it. Okay, so we're going to stop live stacking and go to our next object. So we'll use our next target um, sequencing command. And let's look back at our comments and see what else we picked up. There's no one best type of telescope. All depends on what you're looking to do with it. That's exactly right, Ernie. Uh, and there is, I wonder if, Frank, did you mean to say there's no right first scope or did you say there is a right first scope ryan makes videos it's clear in maryland can't discuss ea without talking about troubleshooting in the moment something everyone may encounter yeah frank corrected no right first scope in other words the best first scope is the one you use by all means well said frank uh, so we talked about the oh let's go to our next object first and let our next object be forming and that way we can be live stacking while we talk. You know what I'd like to do is look at a section of the moon that we're only able to see tonight. In terms of our order here, we could look at Virgo A next because the moon will always be with us. So let's slew to Virgo A and let's center on Virgo A. What is Virgo A? I don't even know what that is. Uh, show info. Virgo A is an elliptical galaxy. Oh, it's M87? Yeah. Well, why didn't they say so? <laughs> I've never I've never known it as Virgo A before. Is it really called Virgo A? Anyway, M87 is a giant elliptical galaxy that dominates the vertical the Virgo cluster of galaxies. It is one of the more massive galaxies known, tipping the scales at several trillion solar masses. Oh my goodness, that's a lot. Imagine adding together several trillion of our own suns and making something. At its center is a three billion solar mass black hole. I'm afraid to look at this because just by looking at it, we might get sucked into it. <sighs> Uh, a huge jet of hot ionized gas, plasma, extends out from the nucleus. 
but it is only visible through the largest amateur telescopes. Despite its huge size, M87 resembles an unresolved globular cluster and offers little in the way of details in small telescopes. The tiny 11th magnitude elliptical NGC 4478 can be observed only 10 minutes 10 arc minutes from M87. So let's see if we can get NGC 4478 in the frame. So we're going to try to zero in here. And let's look at what we've got. NGC 4478, where are you? NGC 4478. Now I see some other messy objects out here. Oh, there's 4438. I'm not seeing it. Oh, here it is. NGC 4478. It's already in the frame. Very close. You know, I think I added this image from one of our observing nights. I can tell because it says here, M87 image. I actually added this because I thought ours was better than the one they provided with Starry Night Pro. So that's a feature I like of Starry Night Pro. It lets me put the image there and that way I preserve it in the night sky along with everything else. So anyway, we like this. Let's go back over to here and you can see that smudge in the middle. So let's change the name to M87 or Virgo A as we now know it to be. And we don't have to um, plate solve. Let's just immediately start imaging. And it clears the live stack for us. If you don't have the sequence done, you might actually have to do the clearing of the livestock. Um, okay. Um, let's, while this is forming up, while it's livestocking, oh, you know what else I meant to do? I have this new thing going on. Look at this. I can say M87 Virgo A And um, then I can look up how far away it is if we have that information. How far away is Virgo A? Um, does it tell us the distance here? It doesn't. Does it? So we're going to have to actually look that up. Oh, wait, maybe it'll tell us here. Radial velocity, galaxy type, parent magnitude, tells us everything but the distance, sadly. So what we do in a case like that, if we want the distance, we just look it up online M. 87 distance, 54, 53.4 million light years. So then here we can say 53.49 million light years. Now, isn't that fun to have that on the screen? So if, you know, if you forget what object we're looking at now, you can see the name of the object down there. It, it's actually rather fun, isn't it? Ah, oh, 60.021, Dennis says. Okay, so let's say, um, about 60 million light years. How about that? Is that better? Okay. And I'm going to start trying to remember to change that with each object because, uh, you know, I notice when I'm looking at other people's uh, live streams, I'll, I'll tune in late or, or whatever. I'll just sometimes forget which object it is. And, you know, it's so, it's so tiny sometimes to look at um, the, um, the tiny window up here where we type it into SharpCap. I just can't read it sometimes. So while we're talking here, let's look, get a little bit better image of M87 here. 
So we can kind of watch that forming. And again, we're going to zoom in on this because it is rather tiny. Wow. Can you imagine? Um, there is a 3 billion solar mass black hole in the middle of this giant elliptical galaxy. We would never know it. Now, if we had something like um, the Hubble Space Telescope or the new JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope, we could see that, uh, uh, you know, jet of hot ionized gas extending out from the nucleus. But with 11-inch uh, Rasa, I don't know if we can make that out. Let's go ahead and go beyond our, let's go up to 300% here. Anybody make out any uh, ionized gases? I'm not seeing it. But we can always look it up in Hubble. Um, now remember, there was another object. If I hold the control key down and use the wheel on my new mouse, Frank taught me that I can zoom in with my wheel and my control key. Let's use our plate solving deal if it'll let us. We didn't do a plate, I don't mean, I mean deep sky annotation. No, we didn't plate solve. So it's not able to do annotation unless you plate solve often. So that's one of the downsides of jumping right to the object. So maybe we should get in the habit of plate solving in case we want to. Okay, while this object is forming up a little bit, uh, 60, I think you're right, still is off a little bit. Mileage will vary. It's the little spur that's at 12 o'clock, Frank says. The little spur at 12. Might it be this? That's about 1 o'clock. I don't see any spur. Oh, I see what you're saying. It's so tight to the galaxy that it just looks like a tiny little spur here. Do you think that's the neutron jet? Or are you saying that's NGC 4478? Is that the neutron jet? Oh my goodness, are we seeing it? Frank, you just made my night. I'm going to go over here and say, add a log entry. Oh my goodness. Frank says we can see the jet of hot gases um, in the form of the tiny spur on the 12 noon side of this object. That is so fun. I mean, I can see that spur. Can you play solve without recentering? That's the jet. Oh my goodness. Frank, Schenectady, New York. Frank, Rosetti, you just made my night. That is hilariously fun. Wow. I mean, we can definitely zoom in more. But I think the jet almost shows up better like this, doesn't it? Now you can make out that jet, that spur. Wow! I just want you guys to know that I'm not able to mask my enthusiasm about this, <laughs> if you couldn't tell. <laughs> oh my goodness. That is so fun. <laughs> no, Frank. Uh, you know, the problem, 
The problem, Mike and Ernie, is that I'm live stacking. And if I if I played solve, oh, you're saying played solve without sync. Is that what you mean? Played solve only. Oh, sneaky. <laughs> nice poker face. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> um, like a kid at Christmas. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, this is new to me. I, I have never thought about the fact that while I'm live stacking, I can play solve without syncing and then do deep sky image annotation. You guys are just teaching me. all. This is why I tell you all the time I'm an explorer, not a guide. Um, so we also played solved, <laughs> played solved without syncing and then added deep sky annotation to find NGC 4478 along with NGC 4486B of all things and I see 343 barely. I mean, I see 343. You have to use your imagination a little bit. But look, we can see we did see NGC 4486A. Now I wonder, oh, I see. What they're saying is, gang, that this is like a galaxy group. These three, they're saying that the Virgo uh, galaxy or M87 is so powerful that it's interacting with these two and they've formed this galaxy group. Here's 4478, there's 4476. Oh my goodness, look at all these. <gasps> this is an ocean of galaxies. I feel like we're just suddenly Hubble. <laughs> wow. Now, I'm going to save the whole frame in case so this is now going to be called M, let's call it, I'm afraid to call it just one galaxy, Virgo group. That's probably what we'll have to call it, Virgo A group. And then um, it's at uh, 11 minutes, uh, 34 frames, we put the date first, don't we? 2022-02-19. Um, 34 frames, Doug. Something like that. Um, and the reason why I wanted to do the whole frame is to show off Robin's work. And we can go back then and look at all of these galaxies one by one. And then we'll also save this exactly as seen. Well, I'm going to tell you guys. Yeah, Ernie says, can't shake a stick and not hit a galaxy. Virgo cluster. What version of Sharp Cap are you running? Annotate should bring up a little box in the bottom right corner with some additional options. Um, there is a box here to make notes. But I'm not seeing any boxes down here unless it's off of my frame, which I guess is possible underneath this. No, I don't think it would be underneath this. Um, I'm on the version that came out 
like tonight. I, I, I literally upgraded this tonight. I, before every live stream, I always upgrade. So this is the latest beta version you can get for SharpCap. Oh, it's a separate window and can be outside the main SharpCap window. Brent says, I see it now. Huh. Oh, down here. <laughs> I see. Here we go. Let me bring this up where you can see it. So it's listing all the galaxies here as a group. And then, oh my goodness, he's got information on every single one, doesn't he? Okay, so I'm just going to pause for a moment. Lord, thank you for Robin and for his amazing mind in programming this software. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just had to pause and give thanks. Is it Robin Glover, I want to say? Is that his last name? Glover? Whatever his last name is, Robin, if you ever hear this, you are amazing. <laughs> and look, this one's yellow for some reason. Okay. We got to pause for a second and say something more about EAA because I notice we're coming up on, you know, we've been doing this live stream now for, for almost two hours. Let's say a little bit more about EAA now. Um, we've talked about the, the optical tube assembly. And by the way, I'll just mention the camera is important too. <laughs> we've talked about the optical tube assembly. We talked about the mount. Now let's talk about the camera. Uh, the camera you see riding on top of the scope is this all sky camera and it's the one that's giving us this view of the whole sky so see it's not looking through a telescope at all in fact it has a wide angle lens on it so you see this 150 degree view of the night sky uh, by the way behind that camera is uh, the power distributor and the usb hub both done by pegasus astro um, but let's look at the actual camera and you can see the camera better in this still photo that I took before, uh, I think last live stream we did. On your left, you can see the, uh, the actual camera fastened to the front of the Rasa without the dew shield on. And then on the image on the right, it's two images of the camera, same camera. On the right, you see the camera after the dew shield has been mounted on the front of the scope. So this is an ASI uh, 2600 uh, MC Pro camera, a one-shot color camera. Uh, let's talk about the camera for a second. I, I think probably I'll put in the description a, a website that is very helpful uh, if, if you are wanting to study different kinds of cameras, and it's done by Agena Astro. In in fact, I think I have a shortcut key to bring that up in one fell sloop if it works. Yeah, it worked. Uh, let me just for a moment move this up in your view so you can look at this with me. That was the wrong. Uh, Agena Astro. And what you want to do is look for... A Gina Astro EAA um, here's an article on beginner's guide to choosing equipment for deep sky imaging and it has an EAA slant to it and I'll put this description in the um, notes you know down below let's see let's go back to the screen so you can you can see the screen with me uh, in this Agena Astro I wonder if I can take this and put it here for you so that might show the link in this Agena Astro article there is so much good information about cameras and notice it is a beginner's guide for choosing equipment for deep sky EAA. I mean, it is written exactly for, for our topic. And I would just refer you to that article because it, 
in one article, it teaches so much about the camera. I just read this again and again because every time I read it, I learn something new. I mean, it deals with things like quantum efficiency of the camera. So you can make a very informed decision. Now, obviously, they hope that you'll buy um, a camera from them. And I did, to be honest, because I, I wanted to say thanks. They list whatever cameras they have and they show you a nice uh, sort of a chart according to the way those cameras stack up and you can make a very informed decision. But I'm going to tell you this, you can read this whole article and then do a, a sh you know, shopping extravaganza on the web and find out if they're being honest with you about the pricing. And if you don't like the pricing, then you can go somewhere else. So this is a great article and it covers a lot. Thank you, Brian Ventrudo. It's a great article that will teach us a lot about cameras. So it's the third thing of the imaging train. And, and that's the way I'd encourage you to think of it is first figure out what mount you can afford. And then after that, figure out what optical tube you can afford and make it the biggest optical tube you can afford. After that, start looking at cameras and um, decide the best camera you can buy. And I'll tell you what is a good rule of thumb. Um, here's a good rule of thumb. And, and I just... I just would like to recommend this myself. This is not something that you'll read on the web, but here's a good rule of thumb. Plan on spending about a third of your budget on the mount. A third of your budget on the optical tube assembly and a third of your budget on the camera and you won't go wrong. So for instance, if you buy someday, you maybe you gotta save your pennies, if you buy the EQ6R Pro mount first, you won't go wrong. That is a workhorse mount. It'll carry about what? I noticed, Ernie, I think you had that. Is it 40, 40 kilos, right? Or is it 20 kilos, 44 pounds? I forget. Uh, Ernie or somebody will confirm that for us. EQ6R Pro, great mount. Then spend a third of your budget on the optical tube assembly. So if you spent $1,600 on your mount, you could spend $1,600 on your, on your optical tube assembly. And then if God blesses you, and if you save up your money, spend $1,600 on your camera, and oh my goodness, you would have a knockdown, drag out, amazing EAA rig. If your budget is, is $1,000, spend $330 on your mount, 330 on your tube, 330 on your camera. Now, this is just Doug talking, you know, 44 pounds, Ernie says. This is just Doug talking. Don't try to find this somewhere else, but it's just, it's just my personal rule of thumb. Everything scales up. If you want a bigger optical tube assembly, you got to get a bigger mount. And then you want to have a nicer camera to put on that bigger optical tube assembly to take advantage of it. And this thing... Pretty soon you get this thing called scope creep, you know, but whatever you can afford, figure out your, your budget and then go for the mount first. I saw a friend of mine over in uh, Holland. Uh, I think his name is pronounced Vido or Wido. Maybe you've come across him. He often wears a shirt and, and when you read it at first glance, it says something like, I love my wife. That's what the big print says. But when you look closer and you look at the fine print, there's a lot of fine print in there, yeah, you know, below. I love it when my wife lets me buy astronomy gear or whatever. So you got to decide what won't break the budget with your family, with your home, with your mortgage payment, with your car. Figure out what your beginning budget is and go for a, a, a beginning rig just to get started. And don't buy something with a poor mount that's you know rickety but but get the best mount you can afford and then scale up from there a third for your mount a third for your tube and a third 
for your camera. Now, after you buy those three things, you know, the rest is really just accessories, but let's talk about some of the accessories. Here's this, um, you know, dew shield. You're probably, yeah, aperture fever, Ernie is right. This dew shield, you'll want some kind of dew shield because especially if your scope ends up with a corrector plate in front or a, maybe you've got a refractor and so you have a lens in front, really it doesn't matter. Even if you have, like if you've got an SCT and it has that SCT, the Schmidt Cassegrain corrector plate in front, anything you get though is eventually going to get soaking wet with dew if you don't have that um, dew shield and then you will probably need Look at that little band that you can see around the red camera, which is looking up in the sky. That's a little dew zapper band that warms up the lens and it chases the dew away, you know? Um, look at the dew band around the front of the white tube here, right at the, at the intersection of where the black dew shield starts. That's another dew zapper band it heats up the front of the rasa, you're gonna need that because unless you live in a place like Mike does, which is a desert, you're gonna have dew, I bet, one-fifth of the nights that you observe. So you're gonna need a little dew zapper. And if you get one of these, um, you know, power supplies from Pegasus Astro, and I, I don't know if you can see it or not on your screen. Let me see what you're looking at. Let me move it over here in the in the view. Um, you can see here the Pegasus Astro software we've got running. It says the temperature outside is 25.9, and the the dew zapper band is is working. It, it's it's zapping. You can see dew A every time it gives amperage. You can, I don't know if you can read that fine print, but you know, it, it basically zaps the dew zapper. There it went for 1.1 amps for a second. Here it's gone back down to 0.9, and there it's 0.8. So you can see exactly. Now on my little uh, 178 camera, it's just putting one-tenth of an amp on that dew zapper band. But if you get a Pegasus Astro Pocket Power Box Micro, it'll take care of a lot of your power needs on the scope and your dew zapper bands as well, all in one little uh, blue box. And that Pegasus Power Box Micro is the smaller box, I'm sorry, yeah, the smaller box that you see on top of that little equipment rack and then equipment plate. And then here, again on the screen, you might be able to see, um, this software, which is running the USB control hub, you might need a USB hub on your scope. Uh, if that's the case, you know, this Pegasus Astro, I highly recommend it. It's designed for incredibly cold temperatures. It gets down to minus 40 Celsius and still works without sneezing. And a lot of USB hubs kind of, you know, begin to chunk out around 17 or 10, you know, so if you're going to observe in cold weather, this Pegasus Astro is worth its weight in gold. Again, it's the, the blue hub that's underneath the power supply. Um, Mike, do this and do that, Dennis says. <laughs> that's awesome. You know, another, uh, another accessory that some people are going to want to sell you is a, a focus, uh, you know, something, something to allow you to focus and, you see all these fancy focus shields. I'd say don't even mess with it. Just use Nina as your focus, and it's a free, um, it's a free software that, by God's grace, these developers. We just have to say thanks to the Nina people. They're gonna, they're gonna give you the software for free, and built in is a an automatic uh, focusing routine. That's a lot better than anything you can do with one of those, um, oh, what are they called? The, the Botanoff mask, you know, those Botanoff mask things. They're really just approximating focus gang. You know, it'll, it'll let you see across 
a cross intersection, but boy, if you use Nina, it's all math. You know, it focuses so precisely as long as you have a motorized focuser on your scope. And again, you can see that motorized focuser maybe on the very end, on the very end of this scope, you can see a little projectile sticking out on the, on the opposite end of the dew shield. And that is that focus motor. This one happens to be a Celestron, but whatever focus motor you have now, Sometimes you'll need something to pull these things together in a power supply. You'll need some kind of 12 volt power supply to power this. I've now gone to this, this uh, 12 volt power supply down here in a, in a rig that you might call a rig rack. And on the bottom floor of this rig rack, you see the 110 power supply and it filters it out so you get nice clean 110. On the second story, uh, the second rack space is the 12 volt power supply here on the left and also uh, this special, um, uh, what are these called? Um, a rig runner, I think it's called, and it filters out the 12 volt. And then this is the solution I have for running my signal inside where I observe. It's uh, currently 26 degrees outside, and I would probably last out there maybe one hour before I'd start getting too cold. Uh, with this little uh, Icron, what is it, a 20, 31, 24, whatever, it converts the USB to um, fiber optic, and then uh, I run the fiber optics into this building up to like, 100 meters, so 300 feet of that fiber optic cable. And I happen to be about 200 feet from this observing location. So I'm where you see the telescope right there, I'm 200 feet away from it, right here in the warmth of the office. And back out there, it's 25 degrees. So you're going to need some kind of power supply. It doesn't have to be this one, but some kind of way to get 12 volts to your stuff. And then some solution. Now, Frank and the crew online they would use a lot of times something wireless. So Frank, would you tell your solution? And, uh, you know, Dennis and Ernie, if you guys have a solution to operate at a distance, I think, Mike, you're in the desert. So you operate, if I remember right, right beside your scope. So you don't need some kind of distance solution. If you only need to operate like maybe, you know, five meters away from your scope, like you could use one of those USB uh, active uh, repeater, uh, you know, active hub kind of cables. And you don't even need a power supply for the one that like um, Trip Light makes. Trip Light makes one that's, what is that? Is it, it's about six meters or eight meters trip light makes one and it's nice and you could use that usb uh, active active repeater cable to bring it inside your house if that's close enough for you and have your scope right outside or go to the wireless approach with something like the asi air and then you're operating inside your house wirelessly and you're watching things on a screen uh, via the asi air so uh, Frank and others, if you have a chance, kind of tell your solution for getting your signal inside. One other thing I want to mention for uh, EAA might be that you might want to go with a kit that is um, perhaps a more, a solution that's already built into some kind of a kit. And what we mean by that is something like the Stellina. Um, let's just look at that so you can, you can see it. I'll find a Stellina here. I'm getting lots of Stellina pizzerias, if you can believe it. Stellina telescope. There we go. Um, this, uh, Stellina telescope. Oh, they're showing me all their pictures. I just want to see the scope so I can show my friends. Um, here we go. Is this going to be? something suitable. 
No. I'm trying to find a good picture. And then we'll go to the screen. Here we go. This is the this is the Stellina Smart Telescope. And this uh, telescope portion folds down and this becomes basically a backpackable unit. And if you're gonna spend $1,700 on an EQ6R Pro and $1,700 on a big eight inch scope and $1,700 on a camera, how much does that add up to? I mean, probably $4,500. You could buy a Stellina for less than that. And this is an 80 millimeter refractor with the camera built in and the mount built in and the plate solving and the dew shield and the, the light pollution filter and the tripod and the wireless repeater to let you operate with this outside your house. And it also has batteries and the power supply built in. And if you're comfortable with this kind of a deal, then... You could just spend whatever this costs. And I don't know what these cost. I mean, somebody tell me, what what is a Stellina? Let's just say we look at them. Well, it's about $3,900. Now, here's a Unistellar EV scope. I've been hearing about these as well. And they're $3,000. The Unistellar EV scope 2 is $5,000. So pick your poison. I think the Stellina is the one that we've heard about the most perhaps, and it's 4,000 here from 39.99 from High Point Scientific. If you don't need um, the ability to build a rig from scratch, and you're comfortable just uh, buying a, an all-in-one machine, then what this Stellina lets you do is amazing. You know, you, you basically can, can, um, uh, tune to this on your phone and I think 10 other people can tune into your Wi-Fi router which is built into the Stellina. So they're basically tuning into the Stellina's Wi-Fi signal and you and 10 other people can watch the same object live or you can live stream this, this EAA that you're doing on your Stellina. It's got your your planetarium software built in, so you pick the object. It even predicts what's going to be a good object to look at that night. It's incredible. Um, so the Stellina is a great solution for you for EAA. If you don't want to mess with assembling this kit and, and building it from scratch, just buy a Stellina. And I'm telling you, $39.99 is what you'll end up spending by the time you get the kit you want anyway. <laughs> so you might as well buy it up front. Um, let's see... Um, Frank is fully remote. He has a mini PC at the mount, which uses ASCOM remote server, one USB cable, and one power cable to the Pegasus power box. Ernie says Wi-Fi is iffy. He uses a long Ethernet cable and remote. And you can look those up on Amazon, too. Ernie, if you get a chance, would you give us the link to your uh, Ethernet cable solution? Frank says ASCOM remote server connects to all the devices, the mount, the camera, the focuser, and then serves them to my office workstation so I can sit in front of my big monitors with a comfy chair. Fantastic. Frank says, the camera on a Stellina has a very small sensor. You're absolutely right. It'll take you 40 minutes on a Stellina to see something that you might see in 10 minutes using one of these sensors or five minutes. So it is small. It's like a ZWO224, but it's easy. It's already assembled. Um, Ernie's asking about, do you use remote desktop? Simon uses a Prima Luce uh, Lab Eagle 4, which is basically an Intel NUC, but also powers everything, has USB hub and sky quality meter built in. That Prima Luce stuff is great if that'll work for you. And Simon, if you don't mind, would you please put the link to where you could find an example of that just so people can go look at it. That Eagle 4 is basically an entire uh, computer built into at, at your scope. Okay, so help me think of what we've left out. I'm going to bring up my my cheat sheet here and make sure that I'm not forgetting something because I want to make sure. Let's see, we talked about the, um, the optical tube assembly. We talked about the mount. We talked about the camera. We've talked about a little bit about the software and the fact that you got to run something like SharpCap 
or ASI Air. If you run ASI Air, then you don't need a laptop. You can use your phone or a, an iPad uh, tablet. Uh, we talked about a filter. You might need a light pollution filter. Uh, we talked about planetarium software. In terms of planning your targets, I'll just mention with EAA, you know, you might want to pick a target that fits the field of view you have. And that's where your planetarium software will help you do that, how wide it is compared to your field of view. And I think you saw that. When we, when we look at, uh, you know, uh, when we look at Starry Night Pro, you saw the way some targets were big in the field of view and others were very small. So that, we talked about that. If you're planning on um, streaming your EAA, it's beyond the scope of tonight, but you might need some kind of streaming interface or software. Many people stream to YouTube using a free open source software like OBS, Open Broadcast Software System, Open Broadcast System. OBS is free and it's very powerful. Others use a paid solution like Ecamm Live, which I'm not convinced that you really need it yet. OBS works great. Uh, that's beyond the scope of tonight. But if you want to stream to, like we're doing tonight, we're using OBS. And uh, I'll just show you so you can see OBS basically gives you, well, I said I would show you. Yeah. OBS gives you a software like this. It lets you plan your, um, you know, your your scenes and your object. And then when you switch to a different scene, it's just switching to a different scene. And I'm seeing what you're looking at here. You know, you can cycle through scenes, go outside and look at your telescope, you know, or your live view. All this is done via uh, OBS and um, it makes it pretty pretty easy as long as you're willing to learn it. It takes a little bit of time learning it. Um, we talked about a dew shield and a dew heater, and we mentioned a focal reducer. The focal reducer will come in handy if you have a very uh, high focal ratio. Like if your scope is a Celestron 8 SCT with a focal ratio of 10 point something, it'll take you a long time to breathe in this light to see these objects. So if you put a focal reducer on there, get it down to a focal ratio of six points, something like Frank did, or if you can get it down to four, even better, this Rasa operates at 2.2, .2, which is amazing. I'm just, I recognize I'm spoiled. So again, thank you, Lord, for Celestron Rasas. <laughs> Amen. Uh, I'm so thankful for the scope that God's provided for me, but I, I know that not everybody's going to buy one because it's a real hassle to tune it. And just keep that in mind. If you buy something complex like the Rasa, it is hard to tune the camera on the front so you get it adjusted well. Um, you know, I, I mean, there are other things we could talk about, but really, you didn't need me tonight to show you a slide deck with the history of EAA. I mean... It's a nice topic to go back to 1927 or whatever and find the history of EAA. I know. What I felt like you needed tonight was to see this. To actually see it in action. That's what I wanted to do in this intro. And I hope if you like this, I hope you can give this a thumbs up. It doesn't cost you anything to click that thumbs up button. If you haven't subscribed, and you can, if you subscribe, it helps bump this up into other people's you know, if you want to click the bell so you get notified, that's up to you. It's your choice. But no matter what, thank you for spending this time with us. I just want to close with this thought. There is sometimes a bit of rivalry between people who do EAA and people who do um, astrophotography. I'm not one of those guys. I mean, uh, if, if you have time, and you can go to um, Cloudy Nights EAA forum. You'll learn a bunch about EAA in this forum, and I'll put the the um, 
you know, the, the link in the show notes below. Uh, but I'm telling you, the, the link is basically cloudynice.com and then look for the EAA forum. But it's under, I think, astrophotography, isn't it? Or maybe under observing. No, it's under astrophotography. See, I mean, there's a bit of rivalry. Is EAA a form of astrophotography or not? You know, you get in here in the EAA forum and they're going to tell you lots of rules about it. I don't get into all those rules. I just say, have fun with it. You know, um, do EAA the way you define it and you decide what, what EAA means to you. To all my astrophotography friends, and I have a lot of them, here's what I would say to you. You already own everything you need to do EAA because you had to buy it to do astrophotography. It is as demanding as EAA, if not more so. And now you could use your astrophotography rig to do EAA with very little hassle and very little change. Why would you want to, you might ask? Because you might want to actually breathe in the object and learn about it and enjoy it and then go on to another object and do 10 or 15 objects a night or more, 20 objects a night. Whereas with astrophotography, I bet you typically image one object a night and you're probably not actually looking at it that much to learn about it. And then you use three hours of post-processing to make the picture look good. Keep doing that. But you already own everything you need to try EAA, so you might give it a shot and see if you enjoy EAA. But if you like astrophotography better, please keep doing it. I don't think there should be a rivalry. I think we should coexist together, and you guys hopefully don't disrespect the EAAers, and we don't disrespect you. Okay? Thanks to our crew tonight that have helped us. Um, Simon does sum up everything. This Astro everything is expensive. And Frank just says, indeed. Like a good Stargate, uh, whoever that character was on Stargate, indeed. Uh, Simon agrees it's expensive, but he's used it for six months. He'll never go back to having to mount several pieces of kit on the mount. Ernie says, thanks, Frank. I'll look up that right up. Papa Tech, always great conversation. Really appreciate it. We appreciate you, Papa Tech, because we know you could have been imaging down there in Florida, and you spent your time here. Simon's going to go for his afternoon nap now. Thanks, guys. Great live videos. You're very kind. Frank says, here it is, Ernie. Frank says, take care, Simon. Okay. With that, we're going to call it a night. Man, thank you for spending this time with us. Thank you, Frank and Ernie and Brent and Simon and Guy and um, Mike, Jerry, all of you guys that have helped us, Dennis, uh, Brent, all you guys that have helped us with the, you know, comments, it made the whole thing like groupthink. It made it uh, group casting, you know. Uh, we basically group sourced this. We crowdsourced this intro to EAA, and it was better because of you, as you saw. Uh, so with that, I'm going to encourage you one more time. Check out Cloudy Nights EAA Forum. It's the place to learn. I'll mention one other thing. It's EAA101.com. And this is a book that we're working on. And this is like the work site where we're, we're working on it. Uh, it's all free and you can go there now. It's live. And you can read about uh, this growing book and we're going to keep growing it. And we're doing this as a group. And it'll also be at the front of the Cloudy Nights Forum in a... Um, uh, a, a special announcement there. And in EAA 101, we refer to other sources, uh, like a source that a good friend of ours uh, is doing, uh, Curtis is his name, and he's writing about EAA. We refer to that in this EAA 101. So all this stuff is here. It's got links, it's got videos, and I hope, you know, as it continues to grow, that you'll go to this EAA101.com it's free and there are no ads. So we'll close with that. Thank you again for making this a part of your night. Thank you for spending time with us. We hope to see you back here again. Come back to Emerald Hill Skies. Thanks again to God who gives.